Welcome to the Superintendent's Hangout, where we discuss topics in education, charter schools, life in general, and not necessarily in that order. I'm your host, Dr. Sharetta. Come on in and hang out. For today's episode, I'm taking a little bit of a different approach. You can think of this as a, an informal book review, a book club of one, a book chat, a book conversation, but I am going to be doing a discussion with myself and a review of a book that I just finished reading over the Thanksgiving break. It's called All Clear, Lessons from a Decade Managing School Crises by Chris Joffe. If you listen to season one, about halfway through season one, there is an episode where I have a conversation with Chris. He is founder and CEO of Joffe Emergency Services located in the LA area, and they serve schools and organizations around the country, helping to keep people safe and help organizations uh, prepare for emergencies and the unthinkable. And I I really loved sitting down with Chris uh, virtually for our conversation. And then I immediately purchased his book or put in an order and it hadn't even been published yet. And it just came out. It's uh, a Jossie Bass publication. You can find it on Amazon or anywhere that you purchase your books. It's not yet out as of this recording in audible format or audiobook format. I know when I talked to Chris on the episode, he talked about the fact that he was going in for an audition to see if he would be the one to read the book and record it for an auto, audio book format or whether someone else would be doing that. So not sure where that conversation ended up. But starting off from the inside of the book cover, quote, educational leaders from principals and superintendents to heads of school and youth organizers need to know what effective crisis response looks like. With engaging anecdotes and real-world examples, all clear, Lessons from a Decade Managing School Crises, delivers that knowledge in an accessible and, most importantly, practical way. And I would agree with that snapshot of the book. Um, I've read a lot of books about school safety, crisis management, crisis communication, preparing for crises within the school environment. And very often, books tend to gravitate towards the active shooter scenario and discussions about about guns and about hardening campuses. And, and while that is important, and Chris devotes part of his book to that and talks about statistics on gun deaths and also why some statistics are still not available to us on gun deaths, the book is much more is much deeper and broader than than just that. And that's something that I gleaned from my conversation with Chris in the springtime when we sat down and also comes through in his book. The book is peppered throughout with anecdotes from Chris's life, whether drawing on lessons from a childhood of uh, trauma uh, as an as an adopted child and, and then um, experiences growing up and some experiences as an adult. He has a pretty poignant experience that he relates in the book of going for a run and coming across someone who may or may not have uh, tried to take their own life and how he responded to that uh, and how members of the public reacted uh, when he called for help, etc. So this is really kind of a guiding piece in the book. It's not just statistics and dry plans, although there are some plans and references that I'll get into in a couple minutes, but it's really Woven into this is Chris's own story. I I want to start out with just a quote from the preface. He writes, I grimace at the question, what's the one thing that would make schools safer? There is no panacea. As we'll discuss in great detail, my fundamental belief is that everything in life is a calculated risk. Therefore, I cannot guarantee you will be safe. Instead, I work to educate you on the risks and the sensible mitigation tools with which you can improve your own chances of being safe. I know it's a burden and a great responsibility. You, those around you, your community, in that order, that's the flow. And that's how we'll prioritize safety. End quote. You, those around you, your community. That theme repeats throughout the book. And it makes me reflect on a question that I received from a parent in a parent forum a number of years ago when we were doing our annual parent university on safety preparedness and um, at that time, 
as, as at many times, much of that was focused on active shooter mitigation and response. And the parent raised a hand and said, I will only keep my kid in your school if you can guarantee absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt that nothing will happen to them. And of course, that's impossible. And Chris talks about it in the book that, you know, there, there are uh, risks everywhere. There are risks coming to school that have nothing to do with school, that have to do with just being a human on this earth. Um, but there are things that we can do to mitigate and then plan for things that we believe are likely or semi-likely to befall, and even those things that aren't very likely but would be catastrophic. One of the things in here before we get into some of the practical pieces is that I liked is, you know, Chris in his writing is always pulling on research and studies. Um, he's very well read in this area of disaster preparedness. And he talks about the DISC personality assessment, D-I-S-C, which was created by the psychologist William Moulton. And it's basically a rating scale to assess which of our personality traits come out the most and which of them come out the least in situations of um, emergency or crisis. DISC stands for dominance, so that's the D, influence, steadiness, or conscientiousness. And so we, you take this assessment, and there's a link in the book to, to uh, take the assessment. I took it, and I, like the author, happen to be uh, dominant in the D, high D, as the results indicate. And that's not surprising. Folks in formal leadership roles tend to fall into that category. But as Chris notes in the book, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that Chris Jaffe or I should be the ones always managing in crisis, depending on what the situation is. And we also have to look at what the other members of our team, what their DISC analysis results are so that we can weave together an effective team rather than um, just be stuck in our own areas and not working well uh, together. One of the things on a side note that's cool about this book is that in every chapter there are action items. So for example, for um, this chapter and where the mention of the disk analysis is, Chris, his action item is go to the accompanying website and take the disk assessment and focus on your stress reactions. Come back to the site to look at how you might stress differently than others in your community, how you might stress differently than others, because our reaction to stress and emergency and crisis is not uniform. It's different depending on the person. We can have a you know fight or flight response, uh, which Chris talks about in the book on page 10, or we can have an analysis paralysis response for example, which he says commonly occurs during creeping crises that emerge over da days or weeks. It is the psychological or social emotional response that often plagues leaders at the beginning of the crisis. It's also known as freeze in a more acute situation. It's the inability or unwillingness to move forward for fear that there might be another option and or because one is too consumed by choices, too overwhelmed to even consider progress. So there's fight or flight, or there could be analysis paralysis. You think about something like maybe wildfires that seem to be developing over a number of days, for example, um, and kind of you can watch them progressing and you can we can fall into that. Or denial. Denial is another response. Denial is frequently experienced along with the stimulus of the initial event and sometimes is replaced by one of the responses above. Anecdotally, this is Chris speaking, I can share that denial is the place that most people start out in a school-based emergency. It's refusing to believe that something happening is true or refusing to believe that the magnitude of that very event is as significant as it is. I posit, this is Chris speaking, that denial poses the greatest risk to our communities because denial costs us time. If you don't acknowledge the emergency, you won't be responding to it. Therefore, much of this book is designed around managing denial. And that's then the chapter, the subject of the uh, next chapter, chapter two in the book. That reminds me of, you know, a situation years ago. I remember receiving an email from a staff member. Actually, it was a, a, an email that went around to the entire staff and it went something along the lines of, hey, does someone hear something that sounds like gunshot? And then someone else responded, yeah, I think I heard something. And then another person said, no, that's actually something else. It's a, 
uh, firing range that the police use um, a few miles away, and sometimes you can hear it. And then another person said, are you sure? And I'm looking at this chain of emails going around, and it's people wrestling with whether this could actually be what we maybe think it is. Now, thankfully, it really was the firing range. But there are a lot of examples of that. In San Diego, a number of years back, the Veterans Hospital went on a complete lockdown because at the time they thought there was an active shooter in the hospital. Turns out that it was either, and they're not entirely sure, but it was either someone dropping weights in a weight room that sounded metallic, might have sounded like a gunshot to someone, or a staple gun, um, like a construction industrial staple gun or nail gun that was being used on a project there. Whatever the cause of that, someone made the decision to to lock the place down. And in the end, it didn't, you know, no one was at risk, but that's kind of the opposite of denial. That's someone taking action in the moment. Another thing that I, that really resonates about this book and is really a correction for me is this whole concept of practice makes permanent. So when Chris and I spoke, I admitted to him that as a type A, I think high D dominant uh, person, I'm always pushing to have practice be as realistic as possible to the point where, you know, I've suggested that at times we should just pull, you know, an evacuation drill without explaining anything about what it is and see what happens. Uh, Or should we have false intruders try to get on the campus and try to just kind of talk their way past the front desk and then see how good our our, uh, exterior checks and balances and barriers are. But Chris said he views practice as making permanent. So, for example, one of the things he told me, and it's in videos, uh, YouTube videos and presentations of his online, is that rather than when he's doing a training at a school or whatever the organization is, rather than talking about the scenario, the very unlikely but terrifying and traumatizing scenario of an active shooter on campus, which, by the way, he says as soon as he brings that up, he sees people's shoulders go up and people hunch over and the looks on their face, faces change. And it's really hard for them to even be thoughtful in those moments of, of even talking about the scenario. Instead of that, he suggests the scenario of a swarm of bees, which is far more likely, much less damaging, although you have to think it through because there may be people who are allergic. Um, it's certainly terrifying. and But it's also pretty instinctive about what we do if we see a swarm of bees. We want to get away and get inside and lock the door. Um, And so practice making permanent rather than traumatizing and sometimes re-traumatizing people um, by making a drill too realistic, certainly in the beginning of of this whole process. And he talks about um, on pages 20 and 21, the importance of emergency drills. He says, Our goal is to practice enough through emergency drills that we reach what we often think of as muscle memory, where our response is automatic and we don't have to try to remember the steps to take when in the crisis moment. This allows us to continue to progress even when faced with the psychological and physiological symptoms of stress. It allows us to make the choice today to default to progress such that when we're faced with a crisis, we don't have to wonder what steps to take vacillate on whether it's real or perceived or take any other actions that might delay a response. So the action item for this is he says, at least once a month, conduct a drill to practice the knowledge. And he also recommends checking local, the local news to ensure you're doing drills um, at the right cadence for, sorry, not the local news, the local laws to ensure you're doing drills at the right cadence for the age group served. So obviously that's a common sense uh, piece for schools. Um, but then he talks about the difference between a good drill and a bad drill. So not every drill is good and not every drill is even effective. So he says a good drill is successful because people were challenged, but to a level at which they could still succeed. So it builds muscle memory and confidence. So if it's, if people are too challenged and you're asking people to rappel down walls, people who've never even held on to a rope and held up their body weight or something, then that's just going to be way too challenging and and there's not much uh, confidence that's built out of there and probably no muscle memory. Clearly identifies that it's a drill. Later on, he talks about the rationale for that. Involves all the people who might normally be on campus. 
So that's really important too, right? To kind of choose the time of day and um, it's got to apply equally to substitute teachers as well as, you know, administrators, et cetera. Leverages multiple wrinkles or injects to not just do the same thing repeatedly. So leveraging wrinkles or injects so that there's some variability that are, is as realistic as possible. Uh, goes on and on. Has a recap at the end. Our trauma-informed practices teach us that we need to reflect in order to remain psychologically safe. So he, and there's more recommendations on page 21. And then he contrasts that with on page 23, a bad drill. It says, fundamentally, a bad drill is the opposite of everything we just talked about. So a bad drill generates no learning, challenges people beyond the point that they can be successful and leaves them feeling like they've failed, has sensorial items like simulated gunshots, injuries, or other similar simulations, which the community isn't ready for. And then he has a really important note for that. He says, if the community is ready for these, there can be a time or place for such sensorial items. But if you watch the news, you've seen at least a few of these played out terribly often with good intention, but terrible and painfully traumatic outcomes. Please consult with a child psychologist, an adult psychologist, and multiple external experts before conducting a sensorial drill. Then he says, you know, bad drills don't have a beginning, middle, and end that's clearly defined. There's no debrief, no data, reflection, or collection. And he, he has a really interesting thing that's a good way to end a reflection on this chapter. It says, my favorite saying is that an imperfect drill is a perfect opportunity to learn. So we know they're not going to be perfect. Life's not perfect. And the goal is not to have a perfect drill. The goal is to learn and grow so that we're better prepared for what may, may happen. There's a lot of interesting pieces in the book where Chris draws from the work that the government, government agencies have done for years and years on preparing for emergencies. For example, FEMA, FEMA's four concentric circles of emergency response that include preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation, kind of in a circle. And it's actually interesting. It reminded me somewhat of the work that we do in, in the International Baccalaureate, which is a design cycle. And it's not only IB that does this, where you, you, know, you plan for something, uh, you test it out, uh, you learn from that, and then you plan again. Um, and so thinking that through in the context of emergency response can be useful as well. One of the pieces that I was most drawn to in this book, and it connected somewhat to the conversation, pardon my sticky note noise here, but I'm, this is a real live uh, boots on the ground book review study. Um, so my, if you could see, I've got Chris's book all marked up and I've got post-it notes everywhere, is... Chris has chapter five devoted to analyzing risk. And as he said previously, it's impossible to eliminate all risk. So he says, everything in life is a calculated risk. Driving, flying, walking, learning, loving. Living fundament fundamentally means choosing the risks you're willing to take. I wholeheartedly believe that life is fundamentally weighing the pros against the cons, thinking through the causes and effects and the consequences that come along with the risks we take. And it's interesting. I learned that Chris is a, is a licensed pilot. And so, you know, he very much understands that whole calculation. Uh, but he has a formula in the book on page 54. And um, it's, I can't, I'm not sure if it's his formula or he, he derived it from somewhere else. But in any event, the basic formula for risk assessment, as uh, Chris Joffe delineates, it is likelihood times Severity equals risk. So the likelihood of an event happening multiplied by how severe the impact could be equals the risk. And it's interesting. Uh, he talks about the way to interpret this formula is concrete and universal. An actuary somewhere at your insurance company could tell you the statistical likelihood of a lightning strike on your playground, a car accident in your drop-off line, or an active shooter on your campus. But for the purposes of this book... I don't want or need you to become an actuary. I need you to become an approximatory. And then he says, please forgive that dad joke. I actually like that. Importantly, you have to be vulnerable in the risk identification process. Vulnerability in this case may be the antidote to denial. Vulnerability may be the antidote to denial. Only when you acknowledge that there are risks that you don't... Only when you acknowledge that there are risks 
you don't want to contemplate can you prepare for them. Only when you acknowledge that there are risks that you don't want to contemplate can you prepare for them. So that's the opposite of denial. That preparedness will ultimately protect lives. It talks about the list of variables that could could impact the likelihood portion of this equation, like geographic risks, you know, what natural disasters could happen in your area that might not happen somewhere else. Uh, are you in tornado country, earthquake country, flood, um, uh, fire could be more universal, et cetera. Neighborhood risks. What's the makeup of our more immediate surroundings? How do those affect us? Um, banks in the area increase the likelihood, for example, of a bank robbery, creating an on-campus concern. Yeah, I've experienced that. What's the general risk level of our neighborhood? Um, there's a people component, right? And crime statistics, sex offenders. There's a property component, type of structures versus wild land. Uh, access, how many streets get to and from our school or organization. Mitigation, right? closest fire, police stations. Community risks, you know, what age students do we serve and playground, how does that look? What's the equipment look like? So obviously the list is much, much longer than, than we could um, include here. And then he goes on to talk about severity. How severe are the consequences if that something actually happens? So how severe are the consequences if it happens? And so in order to think about the severity, we have to talk about the people impact, right? Might it hurt or kill people? Property impact, right? Uh, so if you're thinking about a gas explosion, for example, right? You can talk about the likelihood of that, and, and there's all those geographic and neighborhood and infrastructure uh, factors that go into the likelihood, but then you start to talk about the severity piece, right? What's the impact of that potentially on people? What's the impact on property? What's the impact on the, envir the physical environment? What's the impact on the digital environment? What's the impact on, the, on nature? What's the impact on our social environment? our community? What's the impact on reputation? So all of these things that go into this metric of likelihood times severity and then determining the risk. And on page 58, there's a really cool, it's figure 5.1, there's a cool model for a spreadsheet where an organization can go through their uh, risk analysis and um, plug in after discussions on a scale of zero to five, the likelihood that something is going to happen and then the potential severity of its impact. So we actually, at Albert Einstein Academies, we've been engaged in this process and it's very helpful because you can think about, we do, you well, the way we did it is we just started with brainstorming, you know, what are the risks that we think we have now and people put it, the, the things that you would think they would put up on, on the post-it notes, you put them up on the wall, and then it extends all the way up to, you know, acts of war and, you know, zombie apocalypse. Then you start to look at that and say, okay, uh, severity of a zombie apocalypse is probably very, very high in all of those areas, environmental and social and physical and human and financial and reputational, et cetera. It's not a good recruiting uh strategy to have people know that zombies have taken over your organization. But likelihood of it occurring is either zero or, uh, well, historically zero. So um, I don't want to debate whether, you know, where zombies fall into uh, the, the realm of reality or not, but, but I think listeners get the point. Then you look at something like a conflict with um, parents fighting over a custodial issue. Uh, one parent trying to pick up their child and they're not on the manifest saying they are allowed to, but they're the, they're the child and the kid's calling them mom or dad. And, and so we're in the middle of that. Um, so much more likely to happen than a, a zombie apocalypse. I've seen it happen dozens of times in my career and I have yet to see the zombie apocalypse. Destruction to the physical environment, Probably not so much most of the time, right? Reputational, probably not. It's not really going to take down your whole tech infrastructure. But there is, there are some risks to 
to maybe some physical risks to staff and et cetera. So we have to kind of go through those as we think about how we then put our plans together. Uh, one of the things that Chris mentioned, and he mentioned it on my podcast in the context of COVID, but he talked about the Swiss cheese approach. And this is adapted from a book called The Swiss Cheese Respiratory Virus Defense um, by Ian McKay, uh, published in 2020. And this is on page 66 of the book. And the basic concept is that when you, if you're trying to handle something like um, pandemic defense, and you think of the defenses that you put up as pieces of cheese, pieces of Swiss cheese, you put up one piece of Swiss cheese, it's going to block some of the impacts, but there's holes in the Swiss cheese. So the other impacts get through. And then if you take a different piece of Swiss cheese with different configuration and placement of the holes and put it next to that first piece of cheese, then it blocks some of those holes in the original one, but it also creates some additional holes, et cetera, et cetera. And by the end, you have a pretty successful multiple layers of success. And so the statement is each intervention or layer has imperfections or holes. Multiple layers improve success. So Chris then applied that to the, to school safety. He calls it the Swiss cheese model of school safety. And his metric or his drawing rather on uh, figure 6.2 is really interesting. It talks about all of the different pieces of cheese, right? Security strategy is one. Emergency response practice, the drills that we talked about is another one. Emergency response training, which can be part of drills, but it goes on beyond that. Threat assessment team and their work. That's another piece of cheese. Visitor management system, right? We haven't even talked about that, but that's a significant piece. Incident command with succession plans. That's another one. Reunification training, another one. Um, and so uh, part of this figure, uh, Chris talks about the factors that favor protection. So when you layer all of these Swiss cheese pieces together, the factors that favor protection are education, right? Teaching and learning about what this, what these different steps are and what they mean. Community trust, right? Trust within the community that the actions that are being taken uh, are, um, are for the good and greater good of the community and its members. Financial support, harm reduction, effective risk communication. Those are factors that that strengthen the Swiss cheese model, as Chris says. Factors undermining it are misinformation, conspiracy, inequities, crisis fatigue, and hesitancy. Misinformation, conspiracy, inequities, crisis fatigue, and hesitancy. And I would posit that from my experience, because we live in such a, an instantly connected and interconnected world with social media and everyone with a smartphone, um, the imperative of regular, clear, consistent communication is, is a non-negotiable in all of this. Chris writes in the book that when something happens, a crisis or an emergency happens, if we don't, as an organization, communicate it, people our constituents, families, will create their own versions of it. Spoken, written, posted online. If we communicate openly and honestly and directly, they will still create their own versions and stories about it. But they may be just a little bit more hewed back towards the version that, that, that we communicate. So just some interesting points that Chris brings up. What I also liked is that he talks about something that he, that he and I discussed in the podcast, which is instead of only doing a threat assessment or risk assessment, we also consider doing a connection assessment and look at connection between members of our community, between adults and students, between teachers and, and the students we serve, et cetera. Uh, he cites a statistic on page 65 and again, this is 
only in the context of violent attacks in schools, but I think it could be extrapolated out in terms of trying to mitigate other types of less severe, but also destructive actions that could take place. He says, in 2019, the U.S. Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center, or NTAC, delivered a report that concluded 83% of attackers shared verbal, written, visual, or video communications that indicated their intent to carry out an attack, threatened the target, and or threatened others. 83%. Now, he does note that this specific data set has an N of 29, so it's a pretty small set of incidents. But as Chris says, we've seen this hold true across multiple studies and multiple data sets. People don't just snap. With time, thorough and proper investigation and assessment, and a realistic network of folks that the assailant interacted with, police and investigators have always been able to find a person or in many cases, a few people who knew that the assailant was potentially dangerous. How many times have we heard that in the news, right? That there's, you know, something will happen and then someone will come out afterwards and say, oh yeah, well, he had talked about this or he'd posted this or multiple people say that. And so it's that connection assessment and then knowing as an organization what to do early on as by means of a threat assessment to then... Um, try to head that off way before and provide support for people. The book is filled with just chock full of really good resources. There's actually a QR code in the back that if you purchase the book, you get access to a number of resources for free and templates online. Um, There's also a list of, let me see here, this sticky pages. There's a list of all the surveys that Chris talks about in the book um, and the links to them and suggested reading. I always like to see that in a book. I haven't read all of them, um, but Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. I just recently finished Stop the Killing by Kate Schwait, who was um, a retired FBI agent. The Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker, um, also recommend that. That was part of a an Alice active shooter protocol training that I was engaged in a number of years ago. The Unthinkable by Amanda Ripley talks about natural disasters around the world uh, and terrorist attacks and how some people respond proactively and other people are in denial. Uh, it's Lockdown Drills by Schildkraut. Again, um, a useful book for thinking about, you know, what lockdown drills are, could be, should be, shouldn't be. Um, So that's uh, an interesting piece in the book and useful at the end. And then I wanted to kind of wrap up with the something that I found really useful. It starts on page uh, 106. And uh, Chris has put together um, this kind of framework called the rule of sevens. And he acknowledges that I'm often asked why seven, and there are a few pieces of elegance that I'll share with you throughout part three, which starts at this point. But importantly, if you prefer threes, fives, or nines, you could use those two, I suppose. But stick with sevens for at least the remainder of this book, and I hope you'll find there's some real power in the framework. So the seven, the rules of seven goes like this. Seven seconds, seven minutes, seven hours, seven days, seven weeks, seven months, seven years. So from seconds all the way up to years and units of time measurement. So the framework on page 106, the first seven seconds requires situational awareness and trained protocols, right? Look, thinking back to the example of uh, the VA hospital, you hear something that sounds like a gunshot. Situational awareness, protocols. What are the protocols that that particular organization has when they hear something like that? Do they make a call? Do they call 911? Do they lock down, et cetera? Seven minutes. Uh, activation of the, of the incident command team and emergency response directions. That's really still physical safety. The first seven seconds, yeah, that's all about physical safety, as are the next seven minutes, right? Then seven hours. Usually by then there's 
you're still on physical safety, but you're moving into like a parent student reunification. Um, and the incident command system system is still uh, activated at that point, and I I like that Chris points out that most organizations, schools, et cetera, especially schools, because you're talking about reunifying children with their parents. Most most schools don't do a good job of drilling in reunification, right? They're much better at fire drills or maybe a lockdown drill. Um, but telling 100 or 500 or 1,000 or 10 or 20,000 sets of parents that on such and such a day, there's going to be reunification drills and we're going to pretend that something has happened. So there's a huge communication piece there. This is just me uh, riffing in, in, my, in my putting on my own professional hat um, because every time you send out a notice, someone's going to mistake the fact that it's a drill and think it's actually real. Uh, but then going through the logistics of having parents come and quote unquote, pick up their kid after an emergency end quote. So that's that seven hours piece. And then there's the seven day window, which then segues over into psychological safety, right? So the physical safety of the immediacy has passed, but now there's, it's incumbent upon the organization and the community to debrief the incident. And that's really where counseling services, mental health professionals come in. And then the seven weeks plus, which goes all the way up then to, uh, months and, and years really is resume normal activities. This is the psychological safety and resume normal activities, long-term resilience, reflect on the progress and ongoing mental health support. So I think it's a useful framework to, to, to think about. Um, and I just want to finish with reading something from the back of the book that I think will tie this up in a bow. And by the way, again, I've been reviewing All Clear, Lessons from a Decade Managing School Crises by Chris Joffe. Highly recommend it. Pick it up on Amazon or wherever you get your books. And hopefully Chris will be recording the Audible version soon. So I know the other day I was leading a safety committee meeting and I had purchased a copy of the book for all the members and handed them out. And a couple of people said, Oh, I'm going to listen on aud on audit on audible and listen to the audio book. And it's not yet out. So, um, I know, especially for busy professionals or some people are auditory learners. I tend to, I digest a lot of books that way and working out or running or driving or whatever the case may be. Um, and so hopefully that comes out soon. Uh, but the back of the book says true learning comes from a foundation of safety, security, and preparedness, safety, security, and preparedness. When crisis hits, how you respond in the first five minutes is crucial to limiting the damage and determining the outcome. Do you have the knowledge, skills, and the confidence you need to respond to school emergencies? In All Clear, Chris Joffe, one of the nation's leading experts on school safety, equips you with those skills. So, I think that's a good place to end this one-person conversation. Thank you for tolerating my somewhat rambling thoughts and my post-it note sounds. But I highly recommend this book, and it's been a useful addition to my professional library. Pretty quick read. You can also kind of jump around in it if you perhaps know and understand some of the content. You can jump right into there are whole chapters on concrete plans. I was, didn't want to go into too much depth on that on the review because it's really more visual, but there are, some, there are templates for that, and there's a lot of really, really good work in this book. And one of the things that Chris said to me is, you know, as soon as I finished the book, all I could think about was version 2.0 because we never stop learning, we never stop growing, and I think Chris Joffe really represents that as a leader in his community and in his uh, in his work and in his in his company um, and that's something that I think we, we should all aspire to so I hope you enjoy reading this book as much as I did and I'd love to hear uh, feedback from folks
Thank you for listening to the Superintendent's Hangout. You can follow me on Twitter at DVS1970. Please be sure to share this show with friends and family on social media and in the real world. Thank you to Brad Bacchial for editing and production assistance and to Tina Royster for scheduling and logistics. Thanks for hanging out and have a great day. Thank you.